Uh, how did I get into this work, uh, like working with the earth or earth work, as you mentioned? Um, I feel like nature was always inside of me. Mm-hmm. Like I've, um, like little things as I was growing up, I've observed people picking up trash from the street and saying, oh yeah, of course, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Like, and these like little moments of observing other people that are aware just really imprint me. Uh, but something that really, really made me come to the work itself, um, or one of the things was when I graduated university, um, I was already like um, mindful of sustainability and had done initiatives in university, like student groups yeah. and things like that around yeah, the environment and sustainability. But when I graduated, a friend told me this quote and it's happy people turn their passions into their jobs. And then I asked myself, what am I passionate about? And I was like, the environment. And so this is what gave me a frame to say, you know what? I want to be happy. So I'm going to work on my passion. My passion is the environment. It's very logical in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, well, after that, I actually got into private banking. I was looking for work in sustainability. This was 2008, financial crisis in the US. <laughs> I was in Florida. There was nothing in sustainability there in south like south florida well, i'm from there yeah so you know <laughs> uh, so you know i looked and looked i was willing to intern and work for free like at a different like city councils and, but there was nothing so i just took the job in private banking and i was there for four and a half years but i was always very mindful so i did things like um yeah, transforming certain things within the office itself, like getting rid of styrofoam, you know, little things just to keep yeah. that flame alive. Yeah. You know, I drove a hybrid car, whatever, but just like keeping the flame alive. Of course. Um, and anyway, fast forward four and a half years later, I leave the banking industry. Um, I said it was time to really focus on my passion and start really working towards that. So I took a year off. And in that year, I traveled and just took some space I moved to New York City and I started working in renewable energy Mm. but um, while I was in New York I was going to a lot of conferences and a lot of panels and I started understanding that if I wanted to have any kind of environmental impact it needed to be through people and through education Mm -hmm. Um, like so I became aware of social issues I like I wasn't aware of them before and how linked that was to the environment so I already knew that working in renewable energy wasn't going to be like what I was going to do with my life, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a stepping stone, a very short one indeed. So the months passed, I was in this job for like seven months and I was already moving in the direction of, yeah, stepping out of that, like doing something more mixing that social and environmental and actually had this vision that I would be bridging the developing and the developed world. Uh, Yeah. And so that just like started coming to life. And I remember I came to Peru while I was still living in New York. I'm so I'm Peruvian. Like I, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I moved to the U S when I was 16. Um, But I'll say I didn't really get to see much of my country uh, because there was a lot of terrorism when I was growing up and it was really uh, dangerous. So all my trips were abroad, uh, like my family trips and such. So anyway, um, so while I'm working in renewable energy already with this awareness, um, I go see an eco village that's outside of Lima. Mm. And when I was there, I was like, oh, okay, it is possible to grow food and live off the land and have this life, you know? And so I went back to New York and I quit my job and I started reading a lot about social entrepreneurship. And I realized I wanted to start my own social enterprise and that I wanted to work with rural communities in Peru Mm. because they were already in the brink of development. And I thought to myself back then, oh, so if they're going to develop, let's try to develop sustainably. You know, Um, and I had traveled a lot and that had really impacted me. So I said, can I bridge these worlds and have like travelers come and I don't know, just like help help in the development of these communities. And so I thought to myself, what's the first thing I need to do is field research. And so I came to Peru early 2015 and I visited a lot of rural communities. And back then, the question was always what I was hearing in, in New York and social entrepreneurship around scale, like you know, growing, scaling up, whatever. So I was looking for the common thing. 
And what I heard from all of these rural communities um, in their own words, but it was, we want better education and opportunities for our children. Yeah. Yeah. So that again, opened up something else in me. Um, and yeah, I, in that, in that field research trip, I was in the Andes, I was in the jungle, in rural areas, already in touch with people that perhaps like me had left a conventional life yeah. and entered this kind of life of, of service, of you know, working with the earth, working with people. Um, so I started having a lot of references for it, I suppose. So going back to the to the question of how did I get into earthwork, I think that's what I just shared is, is a big part of that journey. But then I think just, yeah, really being exposed to living more closely in a more rural setting mm -hmm. and experiencing that, I think that's what really um, slowly, very gradually, because it wasn't overnight that I just moved to the jungle. It was over many, many years. Yeah. But I think that having that experience just um, made it more accessible for me. Right. And just as an observer and hearing, you know, the limited parts that you're telling me, um, it really seems like your journey and your your work and everything that, you know, your your life is like where it's at right now. It's really a testament to your willing to trust your instincts and your gut feelings and your like your inner introspections because to you had said that um I always felt like nature was in me and I don't know how young like that sort of thought or that feeling um manifested for you but just I feel like that was like one seed and you were like yes, like this feels right to me. And then you moved on to the next thing and you saw somebody and you're like, oh yeah, that feels right to me too. And like, like there was a small step and then a bigger step and then a bigger step. And you just slowly over years stayed true to yourself, even if it was as a banker, you know, working a job that you weren't exactly passionate about. You, you know, you, you tried to educate the people around you and say, you know, styrofoam, like, there's so many alternatives to this. We don't need to use this. It's terrible for our environment. And then you go do your nine to five banking job in the meantime. And that's, that's, that's wonderful too. That's super powerful as well. And the fact that you just continued to take those steps and to really honor your intuition and to, we'll get into it more so that our, our readers can understand the full picture, but to, for it to, for this to be the end result, like, and you're still growing your, this project in Peru, it's, it's very inspiring. And it's, it's very powerful, the, you know, what the, the willpower and the passion of one person, what, what can be done, you know, in a, in a lifetime with just one person's passion and the help of others, you know, that's, that's very cool. <laughs> I want to add one, one thing that I feel like um, helped me trust and just experiment is that um, when we moved from Lima to Miami with my mom, my mom said to us, to my sister and I, we can always go back. Hmm. And she always told me, you can always come back. And that always stuck with me because I always felt like, okay, let me take this leap and go somewhere and I can always come back, you know? So that gave me certain comfort and certain like freedom. Yeah. You know, and I always knew that every step that I was taking, I wasn't um, marrying anything for lack of a better word. I wasn't, yeah. you know, it's like, I, yeah, I embrace change. Yeah, nothing is permanent. Yeah. And to have that sort of permission slip uh, mm -hmm. from your mom is very, you know, if anybody can give you like that little golden nugget of advice, I feel like it's very, the most powerful to come from your own parent. Mm -hmm. So to be like, you can, we can make this change. You can chase this dream, but like, if it doesn't work out, you can always go yeah. back to, to what feels right to you. That's yeah. Beautiful. And you know what, Joanne, I'm getting goosebumps as we're talking about this because it's almost like also like mother earth telling us all, like you can always come back. 
Yes. Oh. You know, you can always come back to me. Um, that's what it feels like right now. Like, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Wow. That's crazy. Chills all over my body. That's... So the project that you have founded in Peru, um, it's called Siendo Naturaleza, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'm a, I'm a, in Miami, I'm known as a gringa because I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not quite American, not quite Cuban. So to me, that means being nature. Is that right? Yes. Being nature. Okay. And like the fact that you said that from a young age, you felt like you, like nature was inside you. It's, that's a, that's a beautiful thing to sort of carry through all of those years and then to to name like you know your organization your your project like what does I, I already kind of know what it means to you but like can you go a little bit more into depth of like what that phrase really means to you why you chose that for for your project and what you do with um Siendo Naturaleza in in Peru yeah, of course. Um, first, I want to say that I like um, I don't think I don't know that when I was very young, I felt like or I knew that nature was inside of me. I feel now that it always was. Mm. So I didn't grow up with that, like um, anyone fostering that connection or, you know, so I just wanted to clarify that one. But um, anyway, Siendo Naturaleza, um, why, why is the project called that? It's a life project, first of all. So it's a project for my lifetime. It's a project that honors life, right? That is in service to life. So that's what life projects for me encompasses. And Siendo Naturaleza, it feels like that's what we are moving towards individually and as a group, as a collective, those of us in this project um, towards being nature, mm -hmm. you know? So the project is not about doing or thinking or proving anything um, it's really about being nature and identifying with this is what guides our actions um i don't know if i got cut off because my connection dropped a bit but yeah yeah for like 15 seconds but um yes i that's that's a beautiful way to phrase that really um and so from from talking with tamara it seems like there's sort of three pillars of um of your project um she spoke to me about um you know self-sufficiency uh you know being able to work with nature to um provide for yourself in a way that's respectful to nature and not taking more than you need and not abusing you know the resources that have been you know so beautifully offered to us or like um is can you sort of go further into like the three or if you think there's there's more like what are the main sort of goals for your organization or your project and where do you what's like your vision for it going forward mm -hmm. those are big questions um <laughs> take your time yeah okay so i think goal is to be nature being nature and what that means also is to be an active participant in the ecosystem that we're part of right? so that's a goal so we hear a lot of narratives around humans being horrible for the earth and that our species are like really really bad and harmful and I also see the other side of like we can be really amazing for the earth also and you know it's just a matter of how and how we engage and how we approach and how we live so um that's one it's like being nature and and participating actively in the ecosystem that we're part of that's right. one um other goals that are um i guess serving this is fostering an, an identity of place here mm -hmm. an identity of cordillera escalera which is the area of conservation that we're next to mm -hmm. that we're basically embedded in and the the we have, we're in a very peculiar context because the people that live here were all migrants and most of people here are migrants from the Andes. So they're coming with different kinds of knowledge, practices 
like agricultural practices, land-based practices that don't really um, apply here and they're not being adapted. And so um, the communities here are not very cohesive. They don't have a shared culture, shared ritual, shared practices. Mm -hmm. And so we are lacking almost like an identity of place and like rooting in place to know how to be here, how to be active participants in harmony with this place. Yeah. So that's another aspect. And, and another goal is to provide an opportunity and a space to people like me 10 years ago that were seeking references, that were seeking answers, that were seeking um, examples of how to live in a way that is um, representing oneness, that is not separate. You know, we are experiencing this worldview of separation. We're living very fragmented lives, lives of, of disconnection. And so, the hope is that by people coming here to learn and study and research, um, also they start feeling more connected and less fearful of nature. And the jungle is a very good place for that because it's very scary in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can 100% relate to that statement. Just growing up, I mean, you got to my Miami, right? You lived in Miami. Yeah. So being born and raised in Miami and my mom is a self-proclaimed Miami girl. So okay. it's like, you know, oh, there's a lizard in the house, like just freak out. And it took me years of like begrudgingly going on like these camping trips and being like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? There's a spider on my tent. I don't know how to get out of here. And I am nowhere near, like, I, I still feel like I definitely, although parts of me definitely don't want to, I, I need to expose myself to, to nature, like in the really raw, like, like where you are, because there's so much fear there. And I know from, from having, you know, my, my sister-in-law Tamar, having spent so much time in, in Peru with you guys and, you know her tales of of nature and being like oh yeah like I got stung by this but at the end she's still so happy and she's just like yeah yeah of course I'm gonna go back of course I'm still gonna walk barefoot like there's no fear there there's only like a I mean uh there's a level of caution I'm sure but she just has such a reverence for the land that that you guys are working with and it's seeing her evolution and like it's it's been a beautiful sort of process to to, to witness and um yeah I would definitely love to to visit one day myself <laughs> that would It'd be lovely it, even just see oh, I can't get over your background it's just like <laughs> yeah like that's it that's I even as I'm I lived in, grew up in, in Miami, lived in New York City for, for a while and loved it a lot. Um, but there's still some part of, of me that's just like, you know, it sees that it's like, a, like a part of my soul is just aching for that. Like it's, I feel like every human being really, it's such a disservice to like, to like your your experience in life if if we can't really recognize that we are one with nature and that while you know a, a level of respect is definitely necessary like don't just go up to like a puma <laughs> because you are the puma also <laughs> like we need to there is a, a a time and a place for duality so to speak but yeah, that just sounds like the sound, this experience that you're having, that you're creating for so many people is, I, I'm grateful that our readers are going to be able to, to know that like, you know, you, this is possible. These alternative lifestyles, if you want them are possible. And even if you don't want to do it forever, you know, even if somebody just has this little bit of curiosity and they they reach out to you or they you know they, in another part of the world they reach out to somebody else like 
if they want to try it and expose themselves and 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 learn from people like you that are doing the earthwork and I they can always go back you know like you said like they can they can try it and they can educate themselves and um it's a beautiful thing yeah it really yeah. is hmm. something will stay you know like um once we experience these moments of connection and deep connection also with nature like these like pockets of magic i would say like you know when you have a deep experience yeah um that never goes away like we may not always stay in that space in that feeling but we we know we know that feeling and that stays with us so yeah exactly and i also see that you know in tamar that you know around half the year she's been spending it in peru and half the year she's spending it here and then I don't know if it's been two, but in the last few years that she's been sort of, you know, living half the time in Peru, living half the time here. It's, it's also so beautiful to see her bring back her, her knowledge and her experiences. And like, you know, we're on Long Island. <laughs> and now like we have, I don't even know what it's called, but it's like this compost machine where we like put in all of our stuff and then we like roll it and like one side is ready to take out to use for, you know, for your plants and your all of that stuff. And, you know, she's gotten her parents involved and her sister like is very passionate about environmentalism now. And it's a ripple effect. And um, like even even I like a year a year ago or whatever like I I lived in Boulder Colorado which is like a very hippy dippy kind of place if you're not familiar with it but that was the first time I heard of composting I was like what is composting <laughs> and I was like well where I'm from we don't do this and then I I you know didn't live in Colorado anymore and nobody cares about composting. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so important. And it's and it's also just like, it's like we look at these foods, these leftover things like as garbage. And it's like, it's the furthest thing from garbage. Like this is this is magic that we can turn into more plant magic and we can feed ourselves and we can feed others. And it's just, I'm very grateful for the ripple effect that in many ways, like with this particular case that you are a big part of. Mm -hmm. And that all started, you know, years and years ago when you decided to just, ah, I work in banking, but <laughs> let me tell them to stop using styrofoam. <laughs> and then it grew into this and it's, yeah, it's amazing. Um, and one question that I have, two more questions that I have for you, and then we can um, wrap this up because I'm sure you have a lot of important things to do. Um, but how has living with the land evolved your experience of like life and spirituality, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, it does. So first of all like living with the land and over a, a certain period of time i feel like i have uh detoxed myself largely from uh the mainstream culture from urban life yeah. and so just i i live a more simple life yeah so yeah. i need fewer things from like uh hygiene products to clothes you know just like it, it's I've gone through a detox of consumerism and what I believe that I need either yeah either for things like health or beauty or fit, whatever you know so yeah that detox is a part of it the other part is that I feel like the more I live here the more I become part of the place and the more I get to know the place and the more that I uh remember so it's like um, the more I engage with seeds and I plant them and they grow into a little tree and then I put them on the ground. It's like I walk and I know that being. I know how it got there. 
I know. And before living here, I couldn't identify baby trees or big trees. Like, oh, is that a mango tree? Is that avocado? Like, not that I knew. And and now I know, and I know them, and I know where they are. And so, it's like before I I wouldn't even think like. Um, how do I even germinate something in a bag? And now like I, I have a table in my nursery full of my, the future forest of this place, you know? And it's like, um, yeah, it's like the more I engage with that, the more I know how to be. Does that make sense? And, and then the other, the other side of that, which is what I speak to in terms of being an active participant in the ecosystem is that so we're living with the land and it's a land that is in recovery yeah. is a land that in certain parts we've intervened and in certain parts we haven't we are in dialogue with the place so the place does actually speak and you know we feel so cared for here and so protected and so welcome this is part of the trust this is why tamar says yeah i'm coming back and i'm gonna still walk barefoot because there's a certain trust like that that we are here for a reason and I started on my birthday two years ago, a nursery, very small nursery, like just, yeah, to germinate seeds and start growing plants that we then we could put in the ground or yeah, germinate future food. Um, and I set up this space in an area that was all grass, introduced grass. I can, I, I don't know if Tamara shared with you about the context, but, and it was all grass, which is not natural or native here. Mm -hmm. And the more time I spent in the nursery, just spending time there, caring for the space, caring for the plants on my table, talking to them, giving them love, singing to them. Um, the place fully regenerated. It's no longer grass. And it actually kicked me out because they were or not me, but like the nursery or me also, like it was so recovered that I could no longer have a nursery there. And so <laughs> I packed everything up and I moved the nursery somewhere else, <laughs> you know? And that place now is, super biodiverse and so living with the land also it's like this it has invited me to be more of a steward a custodian like yes i own i own this land i bought it but i feel a responsibility to be the custodian and and not to feel attached like to um oh just because i built my nursery here you know i'm gonna cut all the plants around it the opposite it's like it's such a joy that me inhabiting this space for under one year it generated this and now I have to move somewhere else and I and I appreciate that because it also invites me to inhabit a different part of the land that maybe wants my company you know I don't know wow <laughs> you just from speaking to you it's like you are the human embodiment of mother earth and just in human form you are just acting as as mother to this whole region that you are trying to to restore and share you know with with the people around you and I know I've said it so many times like broken record but I I truly mean it like it's a beautiful thing that you've dedicated your life to and I I'm very much looking forward to see, hopefully in person as well, how Siendo Naturaleza evolves and grows and the ripple effects that, that you'll continue to make in this world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanna. I really hope you come and come with Sky. And oh my gosh, she would, honestly, she would, I can already see her just loving it. She, if there's anything that she got from her dad, it is her, like, she just loves being outdoors. She could be in the worst mood. And if you take her outside, she'll just be like, it's like an automatic relief. And <laughs> like lately now she's like one. So if, if we're inside for too long, she'll say, like, eh, like, and like, bye, we gotta go. Like, I need to, I gotta go. And, and if you don't take her outside after a few waves, she'll start crying. <laughs> Be like, I need to go outside now. <laughs> and all animals, cats, dogs, ducks, geese. She doesn't like the most that she says is duck. Like she'll say names of animals 
before she says mama she <laughs> is so in love with all animals even if they're like too close to her and like snapping she might just go like this but she's just so in love with the natural world so if anything I feel like part of, one of the things that she's going to teach me is to lose some of that fear around nature and also to expose myself to very natural environments that I am not used to being in without, you know, boots up to my knees and like uh, deed free bug spray and all of those things. But yeah, I, I can definitely, <laughs> if anybody's going to track me out into the middle of the forest, I think it'll definitely be my daughter. So <laughs> I'm, I'm excited, actually, if, if when she's a little bit older, like, maybe she'll go on trips with her auntie Mar to your, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Hmm. Well, if I've asked all my questions and you've definitely answered everything and I think it'll be a beautiful piece. Um, and I hope that, you know, the, the readers, they, if they have any questions, they, they can reach out to, to you and your organization. And hopefully some of them will become volunteers. And um, either way, I know that even just by reading these words, like, somebody may not use a styrofoam cup that day <laughs> and and that'll be enough that'll be um one beautiful thing that that we can contribute one tiny thing but you know they make up the big things yeah for sure well thank you so much thank you for thinking of me and for this conversation it's been really yeah really lovely thank you so much of course. Yes. One thing that's really important for me in Meditation Magazine and as somebody who um, has always dealt with like general anxiety and like strong imposter syndrome is, you know, like we're also interviewing much older people, like people in their 70s and 80s who I feel like a lot of our readers are, you know, they're millennials. They're like 25 to 40, like that age range. And I want them to see that, you know, there's there's people our, our ages, like that in their 20s and their 30s, like they took these tiny steps and then they took those bigger steps. And whatever it is that you want to do, it's, you just got to start with the tiny steps absolutely and you're yeah as I said several times <laughs> you're a beautiful example of that and very grateful for this conversation and for for our readers to get to know you <laughs> thank you so much Joanna oh it's baby sky you want to see oh Come. I want to see her you haven't seen her since you was little oh. hey, hi. Hi. hey guys you can go there Yes. You want to go to the jungle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds good. When you're a little older, when you walk a bit better, okay? We'll go there. <laughs> oh, she gave you kisses. a kiss. Why <laughs> 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 oh, did she give me oh. kisses to the forest? To both of you. My kisses from here. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, thank you again so much. It was lovely speaking to you. And, um, yeah, we'll we'll get back to you when the when the magazine is out and some way I think we'll actually be able to get well yeah through tomorrow or through mail we'll definitely get you a couple of copies so that you could read it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Giving you kisses. <laughs> She's waving too. Bye. 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 Have a good day. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>